Hi, I'm Melanie Richards, and I'm the former deputy chair of KPMG in the UK, and now sit on the board of Morgan Stanley International as a non-executive. I'm also a chair and on the boards of uh, the Eve Appeal, the National Theatre and the Invictus Games that all give me great pleasure. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the Inspirational Leadership podcast series. And I'm, and I'm going to hand over to my host now, Jonathan bowman Perks. Thank you very much indeed, Melody. And uh, you and I were on BBC Radio 4 together with Gavin Patterson, who's now, I think, uh, right up there at Salesforce, doing very well as one of the, the people running the business. Uh, and it was called The Bottom Line. And we had such fun because I'd, I'd never done it before and I haven't done it since, but we were all there in the BBC, the three of us sitting together and they sort of bounced questions between the three of us. I really enjoyed that. And we stayed in touch and I saw you in KPMG. And congratulations for, for what you did there, because, of course, for that and the, your contribution to business and, and to the diversity and inclusion agenda, you were awarded the CBE, which is uh, something I'd like you to talk about later on. But but congratulations on that. So tell us a bit about what you're doing in your sort of portfolio career at the moment. Uh, you've touched on them very briefly. And then we'll go back to your earlier life uh, and what shaped you as the successful leader you are today. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks very much for inviting me. Um, so I guess uh, it's, I'm at an early stage in my next chapter, so we'll talk about my earlier career, but uh, I stepped down from KPMG in September 20, long planned, uh, and spent some time um, doing some corporate finance advisory work uh, since then, uh, selling a business actually. Um, but uh, in earnest, really started my non-executive career back in the spring. So we're only sort of six months in. So you catch me very early. And uh, I joined the board of Morgan Stanley International, which is a little bit like going back to my roots because I spent some time in investment banking in my career. Um, and uh, I've also joined the boards um, of a number of charities. Uh, the first uh, I'm chairing, which is the Eve Appeal, which is a charity that um, raises awareness and raises uh, funds research into the early detection and prediction of women's gyne gynecological cancers, which are a very poorly explored area. And I could talk about forever, but I won't. Um, I've joined the board of the Invictus Games, uh, which you know that uh, in the spring we're expecting or we're anticipating uh, the games at The Hague, which uh, is, is a very exciting thing to be getting involved in now and obviously a very worthy thing to be doing. And I'm sure people ask you, you know, have you met Harry? You know, if, if you're involved in the Invictus game, have you, have you met either of the princes? Well, given that we're all doing everything virtually, the short answer is no, because no. I, I've only joined in the last few months, but of course I will do uh, um, yeah. very shortly. Yeah. And then last but certainly not least, uh, I've joined the board of the National Theatre. Uh, and I think I was saying to you that um, I, um, when I received the call inviting me to join that board, it was a sort of you had me at hello moment. I didn't, you know, I didn't even have to think about whether I was interested. Um, Theatre has been a part of my life for uh, since childhood. My my dad was a um, he was a lawyer, but he was also a musician and a very accomplished musical director uh, of a theatre company. And so um, it was sort of coming full circle. And it's funny how these things happen. And of course, I'm I'm enjoying that enormously. Yeah. Um, I'm also doing some coaching. Um, and I've joined as an advisory partner, Manchester Square Partners, and and I'm starting to work with um, some entrepreneurs and some businesses that are at, at early stage, as well as uh, pursuing other non-exec opportunities. So quite a lot going on. Yeah, there is, and and fantastic. You talked about your father. Let's let's take us back to uh, childhood with your parents, and mm -hmm. you know, to be the leader you are today, with all the experience you have, and all these different organisations you're helping, and you're advising other people as well. Um, what shaped you as you as you were growing up? Who shaped you? Well, um, so I, I suppose where would I start? And I'd start with sort of describing a little bit about who my mum and who my dad are, because I, you know, they they're obviously both huge, huge, huge influences in my life. And I mean, they had a pretty rocky start to their um, early married life uh, because my dad uh, was Jewish. Um, and my mum, who is still with us, is a Catholic. And uh, as you might imagine, getting married in the 50s 
um, that was sort of considered quite racy at the time and and very difficult for both sets of families. Mm. Um, but but actually, what it meant was that um, my parents sort of brought us up in an environment of huge, I guess, tolerance and um, willingness to. And you know, we had all sorts of. I guess because of the theatre aspects of my dad's life and my, my mother was involved too, you know, we had a lot, a lot of difference, if I can put it that way, walking through our front door, but we never noticed it because that was how we were brought up. And um, and, and that that has had a huge impact, I think, in, in terms of, of how I feel about people. Mm. Um, the other thing I'd say is that... Um, uh, my parents were both very generous and kind people. And, um, and, and I think those are things that I've taken into kind of, I'd like to think into my everyday life um, as I've thought about, and maybe not as consciously as, you know, it, it's one of those things you and I were talking about, uh, you know, when we've talked about when we were on that pod, you know, the podcast, when we did it together, you know, it, it's not until somebody starts asking you questions that you start to reflect on why you've ended up being the person that you are. And, and I, I would absolutely put the generosity and kindness that I feel are important things for me as things that my parents definitely instilled in me. Mm, mm. And, and all the different uh, business experiences you've had from when you left school, just just touch on a few of the, of the journey so we can sort of see the, the the stepping stones that you took so so i suppose one of the one of the things that uh, most surprises people about me is i didn't go to university and um i'll tell you a very brief story and you can stop me if i'm banging on but I, i'm welsh the other thing i forgot to mention is i'm welsh and a very proud welsh woman uh, my parents aren't welsh they're both sort of imported and there's a whole background to them but but that means that it makes my it's the one identity that I hold on to is my Welshness and and if you know the Welsh you know that we're passionate about rugby and yep. it, and you also know that that um, you know anybody can go to a rugby match and and be welcomed and it's probably one of the friendliest places to go anyway mm -hmm. I was at a rugby match age 17 and uh, I was in a bar probably shouldn't have been and um, and I, I met two guys who were from um, NatWest doing recruitment. And one of them was a student graduate recruiter. I don't think they were meant to be recruiting in a bar, but this sort of <laughs> And um, uh, one was a graduate recruiter and the other was a school leaver recruiter. And, uh, and this was back in the 80s. And you'll remember we had the miners' strikes and economically in the UK, everything was a bit dire and people were coming out of university and not getting jobs with great degrees. And so I chatted to these two about my dilemma. I wasn't, you know, I, there was nothing I passionately felt I wanted to study at university. Um, and one's was sort of highly encouraging of me going into university and then coming to into a banking career. And the other was saying, well, why don't you just get on with it now? Anyway, um, without a single thought for my own personal safety, I um, shared all of my personal details. And, um, and it was in the days before mobile phones and emails and, and, and onto my, you know, mat plopped at home a letter from them with a big bundle of papers with application forms, uh, with a very nice letter, which I wish I'd kept. Um, I'm not very sentimental about things and I, I'm not a hoarder, so I haven't got it. But um, uh, the letter essentially said, it was lovely to meet you and, and I'm sure you'll do very well, but here are the options and, and here are the forms. And I filled in the form and I went for an interview and I got a job without telling my parents and then announced <laughs> it. And um, it went down really badly. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I don't think he actually forgave me till I was probably in about my mid, mid thirties and seemed to be doing okay. Um, <laughs> And so that was the start. And I joined NatWest as a graduate leaver. And I don't worry, I'm going to fast forward now. And I spent, I so broadly, I spent half my career in banking, uh, about 18 years um, in banking. And then I spent the remainder at, at, um, at KPMG. Um, and uh, in banking, I did investment banking, corporate finance type work, advising companies on the raising of capital and debt and funding acquisitions and so forth. And then I sort of became poacher turned gamekeeper. KPMG decided that they wanted to, and a former colleague was setting up a debt advisory business inside KPMG. Uh, and um, I was sort of, you know, there was a, 
uh, there were there were three of us at the beginning, and now there's a much larger team of people uh, that were built there that are advising companies on raising finance. And then in the sort of last eight, nine years of my career at KPMG, um, I variously sat on the board uh, and then ultimately became deputy chair of the firm in the UK. Yeah, and you had to stand in for the chair when he, poor fellow, got COVID, I understand. I, I did, yes. I mean, I as I described to you, I, I had... A very I had very much this was probably the, uh, the first time in my career that I had a plan and we'll come probably come back to that but in September 19 I'd decided that I wanted to move into a new chapter and uh, was planning to sort of wind down during 2020 and then very unfortunately the chair got COVID and um, the rest as they say is history and I spent most of uh, 2020 winding up into uh, running a, a large multidisciplinary firm. Wow, yeah, a lot of experience. I think it was General von Molk, uh, who was involved in the First World War and the Schlieffen Plan, said no plan survives the first meeting with the enemy. But whether well, it's not the enemy, but, you know, you can, I think it was Eisenhower said, you know, plans are useless, but planning is essential. And uh, uh, he had he had two letters that he'd written. One was to apologise if D-Day was an utter failure, and it was all his own fault. And the other one, if it was success, to give all the credit to his commanders that worked for him, which I thought was a lovely way of, of doing it. which letter does he does he, you know, does he send? Uh, and he'd written he'd written both of them in the days when letters uh, needed to be written, as you found landing on your doormat from Nat West. Um, wonderful story. Thank you for that, Melody. And then um, proudest moments and darkest moments in your life and, and what you learned from each of them, because I, I know you're someone who does reflect on learning of everything that's happened to you what would you share on those two well i th i think it it, it it's all you know that there, there, there are many proud moments mainly i've taken pleasure in in the success of others actually rather than pride in myself but i think it would be remiss of me in some ways you kindly mentioned that i'd been awarded a cbe and um and and you know it, it was a really quite moving thing to be offered really and um when i received the letter from the cabinet office and you know i i go to events at number 10 so from time to time invitations had to directly come to the house so uh, when i opened that letter I, I actually had to read it three times because i thought somebody else, i was being asked to do something for somebody else and which sounds really stupid when i look back on it um but um yeah no i feel huge pride in 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 being recognized in that way and um and hugely humbled and i know people use that word and and you know it's a bit hackneyed but i genuinely you know you know knowing what others were doing i mean i i remember when i actually went to get the award and you know you're standing in a room with other people who have done some incredible things there was a woman who'd worked in the health service during the pandemic you know this is pre-pandemic but with older the older generation and um, had done some made huge impact in her area um, and, and I sort of when you're standing amongst people like that it makes you feel even more humble about why you've been given it and what you've achieved but yeah that's probably my proudest moment. Yeah and just staying with that one it, it is so interesting um, the arrangements at the palace when when you go and, and I was struck um, so Steve Redgrave was getting his and then there was as you say so many people so thoroughly deserving of it and you sort of think who am I compared to these people I was really struck by the queen because she had no earpiece and she had the other people getting their awards before me and then I went forward in my uniform and stood there and, and got my uh, my MBE yeah. um, but she knew about me she knew what I'd done where I'd been she had no notes to read and yet she had a great conversation with me for my minute that mm -hmm. I had and, and then did that wonderful shake and then just gently pushes your hand away, which means it's time for you to go rather than the people who cling on to her and won't let go. Um, but I just was struck by that, both her presence and also um, uh, Lady Diana and, and her presence. Certain, uh, and these are two, two very powerful women like you, they, they have presence. What do you think it is? What is it that ingredient about presence? What is it? Sorry, what was the last what, question? What, what do you think the ingredient that makes presence um, in somebody? Well, do you know, one, one of the things I, it took me a, 
uh, time to learn, I think, was that um, stillness mm. is, is one of those things. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite a kind of an outgoing person and I, I don't I don't I'm not suggesting that I've quashed my outgoing the outgoing bit of me the expressive bit of me but I think that um and and I and I certainly wouldn't put myself up there with the queen I'm still learning right um but but I do think that there is something about stillness and listening and attentiveness that um that you that you don't necessarily have you know that, that you can learn that you can learn how to listen more attentively and you know we all have our moments where we're not listening as closely as we should but um but I, but I, I i do think that that to be interesting you need to be interested yeah definitely definitely no uh, that's lovely bits of advice I've, I've written that down stillness listening attentiveness and to be interested in them. If, like if you want to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. If you want to be trusted, you have to trust others. Um, I, I think that's very profound and, and clear. So uh, you were about to touch on some of the darkest moments or pick, pick one out from among what I'm sure you have uh, a number of experiences. What would you talk about darkest moments and what you learned about yourself as a leader? So, so um... I think that uh, you know there there are very there are very many dark. I mean, if anybody thinks that you know you reach the age, the grand old age, as I am of fifty seven, and that you, you that there haven't been a lot of dark moments, then uh, and I don't want to make it sound like my life has been dark, but um, you know some of them are obviously deeply personal and probably not appropriate necessarily to share. But um, my, my father was a huge um, influence on me and um he sadly died last year I'm and, and i'm not going to talk about that but actually he he had a um, a couple of strokes which took away his ability to play the piano which was a huge part of his life and a huge part of our family if you like and um and actually uh and i'm going i'm getting slightly emotional now because you're making me talk about it <laughs> but uh, you know it's it's um what what did it teach me um and this this happened he lived with you know the inability to play the piano for another decade so this isn't something that happened to, and and just you know i was very sad when i lost him last year but i felt even sadder when he stopped being him if i can put it that way and so i'm sure this, this is something others have experienced, but it, it really makes you realize that, you know, I like to think that I live for today and, and I live for what, what can be done today, but, but actually how quickly, how, how fleeting, how fleetingly, you know, between one day and the next something, you know, life can be very, very different. Mm. And so I, I think, you know, I'm not sure it was a dark moment. I think it was a dark time when it, it made me much more self-reflective and much more um, considered about what impact I want to have. Mm. That, that is very profound for me in what you've just said. And funny enough, I, I have a, a habit stack of positive things I do in my morning. So this morning, you know, got up, listened to The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, um, which I'll come back to. But then there's certain activities I do in the morning, which includes hit training in the garage and then a walk with the dog with my wife. Um, and then I start the day, but I, I've already built up good mental health by the, the positive activities, but uh, writing a gratitude journal as well, a five minute journal.com, which I find invaluable. But today's, today's daily stoic was all about death and the stoics said you need to prepare for death. It's, it's, it's the only thing that's certain in life. You used to say death and taxes, but now, as you know, having been at KPMG, there's some very wealthy people who've managed to cleverly avoid taxes and Trump is out there among them all. Um, so it's just death, the, the, the one certainty in life. And, and, and it was this thing about preparing for it. And, you know, everybody said live today as if it's your last, but it's, it's a trite kind of comment. But I think your experience and, and mine is is very similar in that you know we had 
my mother-in-law who was we were caring for for three years and we saw her deteriorate with Alzheimer's coming on and, and heart disease, lung disease and cancer. And again, like your father, she loved her piano playing, but it became harder and harder for her. And the Alzheimer's made her forget things. But there were special moments when I walked in and she was on her own. She'd only normally play the piano in our sitting room when she thought we were all out. And I come back from dog walk and, and she was playing music mm -hmm. that she didn't have the notes that she didn't have any of the music there. It came from somewhere that music she hadn't played for years, that it came back to her. So it's really quite bittersweet as you see people losing their mind with Alzheimer's, which is so common for so many and linked to what we eat and a whole range of other things which have an impact on us. But I, I, I really related to you with that, that tenderness over your father and his love of music, but that the piano playing had gone. Mm. Yeah, thank you, wow. Well, let's cheer ourselves up a little and talk Please. about, <laughs> and not get too, too somber, talk about um, all that you've learned now and, and you've, you've been involved in keeping G and elsewhere and bringing on the next generation. Of, you know, you're very interested in leadership, development, diversity of people and drawing them on. What bit of advice would you give to your younger self if you met Melanie when you were 16, which is also relevant for other young people who are starting out? Uh, maybe they're not in a pub meeting a, uh, a talent scout, but but what, what bit of advice of do this, but don't worry about that. What, what would be your advice to yourself, which might be relevant to others? So um, I know sometimes a lot of people say, oh, I would have said yes more. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody would accuse me of not saying yes enough. But I do think um, that I would have probably been, uh, I'd have taken a bit more risk. I, I think that that there have been, and don't get me wrong, it's not that I've taken no risk, clearly, but I, I just think that there are moments where I've hesitated when I should have just leapt in to something. And um, uh, and look, I, I don't regret, I mean, the, you'll have heard the way I describe my career. I, I haven't actually worked for lots and lots of different organisations. I mean, in a 40 year career, I've worked for th three organisations, really. Uh, which is, you know, unheard of almost today. Um, and I think, you know, the environment's different uh, in many ways. And, and it also depends on the size of organisation you're in, if you think about it in those terms and, and the opportunities that present themselves. But, but I would, I, I think I would have encouraged myself to take a bit more risk. Um, I think uh, I would have listened more earlier. So um, I'm a much more, and I think it depends on your personality, but I'm a much more conscious listener now. And I, that suggests that I didn't listen at all, which, which I would hate to give you that impression. But I think, you know, when you're an enthusiast and you kind of have a, you're driven and you have a kind of a mission, which, you know, I, I often, I suppose, feel like I've had, sometimes it's easy to forget to listen enough. Uh, and so I, I think if 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 I'd, I'd I'd have been a I'd have learned to listen better earlier if that mm. makes sense. No, it makes a, a huge amount of sense, and I, I relate to that. It, it's 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 almost like you have to relearn it every day mm. to 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 ground yourself. And it's not about you; it's about them. And and rather than learning nothing new because you're just hearing coming out of your mouth what you already know. To, to really give people strategic time to think. And you know, we may have discussed before, I'm a great fan of Nancy Klein's work and her latest book, The, um, um, the Promise, that mm. changes everything, I won't interrupt you. And, and I think to listen and not interrupt is a real, is a real skill, particularly when you're a, um, a, a host of a, of a podcast where you, you still want to get people to speak, but, but not cut them up. Let's go around um, next, the Inspiring Leadership Compass that, that it's just a, a model that my wife, Lee, and I um, found over the years from our experience in interviewing people seem to have some resonance about what creates high performing leaders and teams. And you certainly have spent your time looking at helping people to be like that. And that's the work you've done. 
do you think in your 50% of your career it was in KPMG, you say you didn't work for many different organizations, but in many ways you worked for so, advising so many different organizations. You didn't have to leave what, the home base, but you got the chance to work in all these different organizations. And if you'd liked any of them more, you probably like me and PricewaterhouseCoopers would have gone, well, actually I've got headhunted by one of them to go and to go and work somewhere else. Uh, I love my time in, in, in PwC, but um, uh, I, I also enjoy being a managing director. Um, so, so thinking about the first of uh, the eight sort of principles is moral quotient. You know, your values, your principles, your integrity, what you will do and what you won't do. I think it was Oscar Wilde who said a lady or a gentleman is someone who knows what they will do as well as what they won't do. So what are your top three principles or values that you live by and, and, and why are they important to you? Well, I, I touched on them at the top of this conversation and I think kindness is grossly underrated mm -hmm. and particularly I think actually during the pandemic we've seen a lot of discussion around the power and value of kindness and and sometimes I think kindness is wrapped it put in this wrapper that it's somehow a bad thing because if you're a leader you should be decisive and forceful and pushing forward and so forth but I see kindness in in very many different ways and 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 I guess the way which I think about kindness is sometimes delivering difficult messages to people is the kindest thing you can do, mm. but the most difficult thing to do. So thinking that being kind is easy mm. it is actually quite a flawed concept. But I, I think, you know, if, if I were to, 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 to think about the sort of, I'm going to use three words, there are many words, but kindness would be one. Gratitude would be another, um, and thankfulness, and 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 I, I don't know. I, I have a big thing. I notice when people don't thank people. I notice when people don't. Uh, you 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 were talking about um, Eisenhower and, and the letters that he drafted. You know, in truth, um, we should be grateful to the people around us. The, the only reason that we have the, the uh, privilege of be, being leaders is because we have great people around us. And to forget to, to even thank them or put at the core the question of, of how we show people that we appreciate them. But again, you know, I also think there's a, there's a more difficult side to that, which is, you know, being honest with people when, when, when things aren't right. Yeah. And then, the, the other one, well, actually, I'm going to have two more. Is that OK? Of course. Yeah. OK, so um, I, I, I limited myself to three and then instantly thought of a fourth. So um, uh, the other would be courage. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of touched on that uh, when you asked me what advice would I give? And, and I mentioned risk taking. And, and I think that... Um, it, it, it let's not confuse courage with um, having a singular point of view, mm. but having the courage to take different points of view. But but, you know, at the end of the day, decisions have to be made. And, you know, the, the buck stops with the leader, ultimately. Mm. Mm. So I think courage is important. And your fourth? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Yeah. Say about that. So, um I think my younger self would have said the world is a quite black and white place. There's right and there's wrong. And what I've discovered, and I think the beauty of age is you discover quite how much grey there is, which doesn't mean that, you know, there is there isn't a right and a wrong way. I'm not I don't want people to think that I I don't believe that there is right and wrong. But I also believe that, you know, the things that that you do at one point in time or decisions that you make may not be appropriate at, at another point in time. And I think, I think forgiving people for not getting things quite right is quite an important quality, mm. uh, but understanding, but, but also know, but from that we all have to learn. So, yeah. so it isn't just forgiveness. Oh, well, let's forgive everybody. It's forgiveness in circumstances where uh, we we can see somebody has learned from the experience and and how on earth are people going to learn and take risks if they can't be forgiven yeah right? I, I, I so agree and, and uh, the, the previous podcast was with um, 
Daniel Bernard, who's in Israel, is a very successful investor and, and uh, entrepreneur, uh, particularly in the sports field. But he said as he grew up, similar time, um, he was quite arrogant uh, in his own term that he believed that everything was wrong and he was constantly pointing out where things were wrong and, and this should be done and that should be done. And I remember as a young officer in the army, I was convinced that the generals were all incompetent and I knew much better about how to run the British army at the age of 24 as a uh, as a young lieutenant or a captain. I mean, of course like, you did, what, Jonathan. What, what, of, course, and of course I did, you know. <laughs> I was right. but, but he said that one of the shop, one of the uh, stewards uh, working in the factory he was in said, you know, th there is no perfect world. We don't live in a perfect world, just get over it. Mm -hmm. And I think this sort of, sort of acceptance, not that lower standards, but just accept the way things are. And I think our health gets affected because this is how things are, but this is how we want them to be. And they're not the same. And, and we often rail against it. And sometimes people make themselves mentally ill because they can't make the transition between what is and what they hope it'll be. So I think you raise a very good point. Thank you for those, those four, kindness, gratitude, courage, and forgiveness. Moving on nicely to the next one, PQ, meaning and purpose, you know, Dharma, calling, vocation. Manly, you know, in what you've done and what you continue to do, what gives your life meaning and purpose? Why do you do the work you do? I just like helping people. Mm. I, I, and, and I, I use the word people, but I, you know, you talked about, you know, my, my advisory career and you're right. You know, I work with lots of different companies, lots of different personalities, lots of different people. Um, and in fact, you know, I spent uh, the financial crisis helping to restructure businesses, mm. which isn't much fun sometimes. Right. You know, it's tricky. It's difficult. Difficult decisions have to be made. But at, at the core, you know, I always believed I was there to help others and support, help and support others. And so, and, and again, you know, these are, are concepts that, that sometimes are associated with softness and weakness and, you know, um, but, but actually for me, you know, they give me great joy apart from anything else, but also, um, sometimes helping others requires doing difficult things yeah. you know i i um i always remember a, i was speaking at an event um um in birmingham at the university of birmingham and and they'd invited me to speak about uh, culture and values and um and what i hadn't you know this this is a lesson another lesson be sure you know who your audience is going to be and um they, it was an open invitation so people from the public could come etc and it was in a lecture theater and anyway there was this guy who'd arrived he was poor hearing uh the induction loop wasn't working and so i'd approach him and said look you know how can i help and he said well i can i said can you lip read and i said okay well normally i wander around for and talk all over the place but i'll try and talk at you and so I thought I had a friend in the room. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> Very grateful, et cetera. Anyway, Q&A comes, his hand shoots up, you know, I think, oh, my friend, oh, I'll start with him. <laughs> <laughs> his question was, you know, how can you sleep at night when wow. you've been involved in restructuring so many businesses and have been, he pretty much said, personally responsible for, you know, huge numbers of job losses in the UK, you and etc and 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 you know it was the the reason the question was easy to answer was because i knew what my purpose was and my response to that was yes i have had to help companies make some very difficult decisions and choices that have not necessarily resulted in great outcomes for everybody but what i do know is that 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 there are in order to save some but not all, we had to make difficult decisions. And, 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 you know, you may not see it, but I know, and I know in my heart that I was helping a group of individuals. And those individuals I know all have families and, you know, personal situations, et cetera, that I never lost sight of, never lost sight of. But, but you, you have to keep in perspective the totality of what was trying to be achieved. That, that is so interesting and resonates in a personal way in a family story that uh, my grandfather uh, and his brother 
ran mills, um, uh, woolen mills in, in Calderdale in, in Yorkshire. And they were Quakers, uh, and therefore they looked after the education and the health of their, of their employees and they, often where they provided housing. But in the, the First World War and the Second World War, uh, and they also did some, uh, they brought some cotton in from abroad, which they also uh, used on the mills. Um, but things got so tight that their advisors in your, in your shoes were saying, look, you have to lay off some stuff, you have to restructure, and they wouldn't do it. Because, they, no, 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 we look after everybody, we care for them all. And of course, the whole lot went down. It, 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 they went into liquidation. They, mm -hmm. they, they lost almost everything. My, you know, a generation was very wealthy. The next generation was completely impoverished because they lost everything. The mill closed down. It's now a nightclub in Halifax or pronounced as we pronounced it, Halifax. Come all L or Halifax, the good Lord deliver us because both cities had gibbets hanging people for for crimes that they did. But it was the point where they, they went to extremists, that they cared so much that they destroyed themselves. So sometimes some tough calls have to be made. So I think you make a really good point there, Molly. Thank you. Let's move on to health question. Um, in a job like yours and all the pressures that you have as deputy chair of KPMG and all the decisions that made, and particularly when you're dealing with really what is actually quite toxic times. I, I know some of the CEOs I've been with involved in restructuring and mergers and acquisitions got so physically ill because of the cortisol and the adrenaline all the time what have you done you look in great health uh, what have you done to keep yourself mentally and physically healthy if there were a couple of tips that you give so um uh, the first is you know coming back to the things you learn i, I didn't look after myself for a period of time um uh and and now I do, it, I can see the huge difference. And, and it's probably, I guess, I've been exercising more, reg, you know, very regularly, not like the once a week, like almost every day doing something <laughs> um, for about the last 10, 12 years. And, um, and, and it, was, it was sort of a push came to shove thing. And, I, and, and so I wish I'd come to it sooner if I can put it that way so you know you were talking about doing hit training first thing in the morning I do some of that and uh, I do a lot of pilates um I used to run uh, but now my knees don't like it um and you know the the, the fit physical I the biggest thing for me is if if you know you ask for younger advice for young you know if my, to my younger self I wish I'd exercise more and of course one of the challenges was that I had young children. So I've got two boys and um, and I think I didn't allow myself enough space that for, to look after me, if I can put it that way. So, you know, there was the work, there was the kids. Um, and um, and what I realized was that actually the invest that the investment in time of reading a book or reading the FT it's actually all it's as important to invest in making even if it's 20 minutes or half an hour to physically do something whether it's go for a walk or whatever else has been hugely important yeah and and building on that i've just uh, been reading uh, i'm dyslexic so i probably read about uh, listened to rather than read but it's my version of reading about 200 audiobooks in the last three years i've just become a almost obsessive my my wife sort of teases me at time because i want to learn to have the knowledge to to share with others and i particularly had a bout of about 30 books on health and well-being the microbiome and, and one of the things that uh, struck me in a book i read recently uh, food wtf should i eat <laughs> um, what the heck should i eat perhaps we should say that mm -hmm. uh, by dr mark hyman uh, which is very interesting and i commend it to you and others listening it is that he said you know one of the is, is uh, care for the, uh, the liver and feed the gut, um, but that you can't exercise your way out of a, a bad diet of sugar, carbohydrates and refined flour. You know, you just you can't exercise however much you do. If you if you if you if you're a sugar junkie and you have lots of the white death, you, you're not going to be well. And, and I just wondered what what you've done also to, to look after not only yours, but you've got two boys and your husband, you, your diet for everybody. Uh, what's been your experience over the, the years? Well, um, again, not a great role model on that front um, because I'm 
I, I, I'm, I'm a sugar junkie who has to keep it under control. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, I go through patches of, of uh, so, so the good news for those on this, uh, on this podcast, listening to this podcast is, uh, you've now you've now hit upon my you know absolutely you know worst part about me is I would eat loads of sugar and anybody who knows me knows I love a bag of Haribo um, which uh, sorry no advertising of course <laughs> <laughs> and so um, but uh, you know I have to very very consciously contain it mm. absolutely consciously contain it um, luckily for me I don't do the cooking my husband does all the cooking thank god because he's a really good cook um and i'd like to think we are pretty healthy eaters aside from the sugar thing um you know i don't i i do watch how much carbohydrates i'm eating and i do watch um that i'm getting fish and meat and all the protein and all of those other things mm. but i don't have a kind of magic kind of uh, formula so to speak yeah, well, um, but i do do fasting yes I, i'm um, an intermittent faster what how yeah. many hours fasting and how many hours eating so I try and I try most days not to eat for 12 hours. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes I get up to 16. I try and do a couple of days where it's sort of closer to 16. Um, the thing that I find that, that I find that 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 was helpful for was because I was doing a lot of breakfast, lunches and dinners, mm. you know, meeting people, you know, that was part part of my job was to meet clients and people and very often it involved food and and entertainment yeah. um uh, i hasten to add very you know i uh, i one thing i don't have a particular issue with is drinking i don't think because or don't get me wrong i like a drink but i'm very capable of not drinking for days on end it, you know it's one of those things that if it's if it's it, with a meal fine if if not, then I you know it's neither here nor there, and 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 I think also helped by the fact that my husband doesn't drink uh, yeah. now. He's not been drinking for twelve years, so we don't drink at home. And so so yeah, I mean I I do think alcohol can be quite damaging in the sense yeah. of you know the kind of the thing to go to, and everybody has a relationship with alcohol that's different. But yeah, yeah, I try and I try and. For those who have seen me with more than one glass in me, you will know that I do like a drink. But um, I, I can have, as I say, I think being capable of not having something for days on end is quite a good discipline. It, it certainly is. And, and I, I, I've joined you with that, I, you know, brought up in the army where, you know, I remember at 16, you know, they tried the Duke of Wellington's regiment tried to force sort of five or six pints of beer down me you know and I just I just thought really is this what the machismo is and these guys are these huge beer bellies and so that's what I aspire I don't I don't aspire to be like that so yeah I, I occasionally do like a, a drink but I can happily go without it and my late brother David and my brother Graham have both given up completely um, and, and I, I am pleased you talk about the intermittent fasting or what they call time restricted feeding or time restricted eating because I've, again, researched a lot around this in the circadian rhythm. And um, I, my wife and I, Lee and I now do 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of eating. And the reason I've gone, I, I, if we're on holiday and you've got to have a breakfast in the hotel, I do the 12-12 like you. But I, I do know that, that generally most of the year I'm 16 hours of fasting because in hours 12 to 14, you get the ketosis, which feeds the, the brain with burning up certain uh, fats, which is very good. And I find my brain super clear in that stage of hours uh, 12 to, to 14. But then 14 to 16, which is so important after David's death of cancer, is, is that's when you're breaking up the cancer cells and generating new cells. So anything you can do from 12 to uh, 12 to 16 hours is, is really 14 to 16 hours mm. is really beneficial. Um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, on to quickly fire through a few on EQ, CQ, RQ, BQ, and LQ. Let's go for EQ. What's what's your top tip for um, good emotional intelligence? Well, you've got that. that, that it's got to be listening. Mm. And and you know, I think um, I think I think you know, emotional intelligence is described as being able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else, right? Mm. Broadly, I mean, I'm sure you've got a better definition, Jonathan, but. Um, I, um, I spend a, 
not an over when I have conversations with people, particularly conversations where um, I'm not sure where they're coming from, or um, uh, I think that the capacity to think through how they might be feeling without assuming how they might be feeling, if that makes sense, mm. is is very is key. Um, and I think um, one of the things I, you know, I think Zoom's been a great, you know, it's been a great opener of many things, including being able to do this with such ease. Mm. But I think you can feel what's going on in a room if you breathe and pause and, li and, and listen. And sometimes even in silences, you can feel in a room how people are feeling you know that there's a there's the you know, people describe the uncomfortable silence it exists mm -hmm. but you have to be very very attentive yeah yeah so true and and uh, brought up as i was in a sort of mixture you talked about jewish and catholicism in the sort of mix mine was uh sort of uh church of england and quaker uh sort of family of four generations of quakers and that they would have a meeting house room with no vicar or whatever just everybody there in a sort of circle uh, and then someone would be moved by what their feeling is the the mood of the room you know what's going on and so you had to had to pick that up and that's where i think nancy klein in her work um in a quaker school then took it on to 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 really the skill of really getting people to think for themselves without being interrupted uh be beautifully put and on from that one is one so closely linked to that, but also very linked to your CBE. It's it's cultural intelligence, um, a mixture of how you collaborate with others, but also diversity, equality and inclusion. What would be your top tip on cultural intelligence and, and those aspects? Well, I, I think I, I would use the curious word in this context, which is, you know, and back to that point that I made about to be interesting, you need to be interested. And, and actually, you know, people talk about diversity and inclusion, and actually, it's being curious about understanding the whole person. And sometimes people confuse that with prying, you know, you know, asking questions about people's lives, you know, people, people will generally settle at the level at which they're prepared to answer questions or or be open about who they are and what they are but they're they're going to be more open about who they are and what they are if you are so i i think that look there's there's no sort of magic bullet on this but i think being curious being open about yourself and being open about what you don't know so you know i i think um and I do think that forgiveness comes into all of this because we will make missteps if we're being curious. There will be missteps in terms of we might ask the wrong question, we might frame it in the wrong way. But I think if you can set up the conditions for people to understand that you care about who they are and what they stand for, and 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 this is less about you know, am I black, am I white, am I Jewish, am I Catholic? And more about what makes me tick. And actually from that, those other things might flow as, as has happened in this conversation. You've learned quite a lot about me and my background and who I am and not just what you see. I mean, you know, and, and, and all of those things are that wonderful blend of, of, of what makes us all different. And I think we need to spend time understanding, understanding what we have in that's different as much as we do as what we have in common. That's beautifully put, thank you. Um, it all resonates and I'm sure we'll do it to people listening. Uh, and, and with that takes us on next to argue resilience question against adversity. Although you haven't and, and won't be talking about some of the personal challenges that you've had, I'm sure that has given you uh, the qualities of coping with adversity and resilience. And what would be your top tip on resilience that's worked for you, but might be useful to others? So. Um, the, the one thing I would say is you can't change what's happened. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and whether this is in a kind of professional context or whether it's in a personal context, I think the thing that helps me be resilient most is, is just knowing that that is a fact. And, and therefore knowing that there is little point, you learn from looking back. Yeah, I, when I say there's no point looking back, there is to learn, but there's no point looking back and regretting and hope wishing that it were different because it, it is whatever the situation it is. So the way in which I've, I've always, I think, approached things and luckily for me, and I recognize I am fortunate in this is that I am, I wouldn't describe myself as a sort of a glass half full Pollyanna-ish person, but I am definitely somebody who looks for the positive out of the negative. And it has served me incredibly well because it means that, and in fact, the more disastrous the situation in some ways, um, I, I think I've learned the calmer I've become, you know? So when bad things happen, I, I, funny enough, the, the kids would probably, my children would probably say to you, you know, she'll have a hissy fit about something that's like, you know, irrelevant. And then something really serious happens and she's, you know, incredibly calm and whatever else. And, and I think, and I think that is because um, I have this view that I can't change what's happened, but I can deal with what happens going forward. Yeah, beautifully put. Uh, and then, uh, so the, I, I love that, and I've ca I captured all those points. BQ, uh, your brand, your reputation, your image, your impact. We can talk about organisations, which you had to help the brand of KPMG, which which became extremely good. Though at times it, the brand got attacked on various things, and it, it slipped. Its its crown fell a bit. It was you know, I mean, one of the best places to work, and then it wasn't so good, and so on. But that that's one thing of, of its of itself. But I, I'm interested in you know, your brand, your reputation, your image, the impact you make, it's what people say about you, Melanie, when you're not in the room. So, you know, you're now in a business where you do things like 360. What have you found the value of things like 360, where you really get the honest opinion from a variety of people or their perspective? It might not be the truth, it may not be fact, but it's how they feel about you or the leaders you coach. What's your, what's your view on brand and 360? So um, I'm, I think the, the biggest learning I had from 360 was about listening. Mm. And um, because sometimes the things that people value in you can equally be things that they find more difficult to handle. So I'm quite a passionate kind of, you know, get on with things, quite driven person. and through 360 what I discovered was that people love that and they loved working with that but at times they felt that, that that their voices weren't necessarily always all being heard and that did that wasn't that I wasn't listening to anybody but it was was I listen you know could I listen to could I listen a bit more and the answer is of course I could you always can right and so yeah I'm a huge fan of I think 360 handled in the right way, you know, can be hugely valuable. Um, and so uh, I hope that my brand is still that I'm passionate and, you know, I, I do things that I believe in. Um, um, I think that, uh, I think if, if my brand is that I help and, and, and support and, people would would be another aspect that I would you know that that's what I would like to think that, that I'm doing and I think the last thing is that I'm open to continuous learning and being curious mm. um I think I think those would be the things brilliant no thank you for that and then the, the last one around the inspiring leadership compass is that of legacy and stewardship and leaving things better than you found them um what would be your your tip on leaving a legacy in your lifetime uh, rather than in your lunchtime as my sergeant major would tease me that I was a, a, a legend in my own lunchtime well 
I don't think you can have artificial legacies, if that makes sense. You know, I, I think uh, uh, we haven't used that word authentic, but, you know, I, I think whatever you, you think your legacy is, it needs to be authentic. And, and, and actually, if, if the legacy were kind of the, the, big, the big picture legacy, it would be that people thought I had helped make a difference to that to them and or to some particular cause but then you you know you take it down to a different level so do I want to feel like I've made a difference to the course of research into women's cancers you know that's a pretty big, big ambition and and look I'm not even a researcher and I'm just one of the people that might help contribute to all of that so um but but I think I think Whatever your legacy is, it has to come from the heart. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 brilliant. And we're now just on to the last um, three questions: um, executive teams, then your favorite book, and and then your top tip. Um, you, you've had a lifetime of working with different executive teams, forming them, advising them, working with them. You've seen good ones, you've seen bad ones. What's your top tip for when looking back at? What you've been at when you've sometimes come across toxic teams that need to become high performing teams what have you seen work most in in turning that toxicity around well first of all not to make assumptions about people in the team mm. you know when, when you when you take over a team or you're sort of particularly yeah where you've taken over a team and then you know maybe you you work to make change or whatever else uh, I, I think very often particularly around toxic teams, as you to use your phrase, there is assumption that everybody is, must be bad in that team. Or, and, and I, think, I think not forgetting that at the point at which you are kind of taking responsibility, that you spend enough time understanding each of the individuals that you have and what maybe has driven the team to behave the way that it does. Hmm. Because my experience, I suppose, has been that, um, of course, you have to make a team work. To, uh, the, for a team to be effective, it needs to be able to work together. But singling out particular individuals as being the root cause of, often it's a whole combination of different factors that are not necessarily self-evident. Yeah, yeah, that's spot on. Thank you. And then... Um... A book by uh, one of your former coaches, uh, I think, is the one you're going to share. Will you just say which the book is? Well, well, actually, I was thinking about this. Can I have two? Is that you can okay? Have, you, can have two. you can have two. So um, the first is um, a former coach of mine who um, wrote a book called Embodied Leadership. And um, it's it's quite a cerebral book. And, and you know, it's it's not on the top 10 list. You've, you've named some fantastic books. But... Uh, it, it helped me at a particular point in time, which was to really understand that it, leadership is not just about how you show up personality wise. It's everything from your physicality to and your presence to um, your ability to listen and the power to listen. All of uh, many of the themes that we've picked up on here. And, and, and I suppose one of the reasons I suppose it particularly resonated was because um, it talks about physicality and what you don't know on this is that, and you know, Jonathan, because we've physically met, but, but your, your viewers and listeners won't, is that I'm five foot. Uh, and if you've ever seen the studies on kind of leadership uh, and leaders, I do not fit a stereotype for a leader, which is uh, not only male still too much, but also tall, mm. you know, the average height, I think of a Fortune 500 CEO is something like 5'11 and a half. And I'm well short of that at five foot, even with my very, very natty heels on. <laughs> um, and so what I learned uh, for all the little people out there is that your, your size is a function of how you physically show up as much as, as how physically tall you are. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you for that. And with my wife, who's petite as well, and a similar size, I, I really value that. And uh, she she packs a punch like you do too. Not physically, I agree there, just what the contribution she makes to society and charities. Um, what was the other book? 
Second. Well, I just it's one that I've I've recently read, which um, is a book by John Amici, no. who, uh, which is called Promises of Giants. Um, and uh, John uh, is himself a, a psychologist and um, he 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 has is at the other end of the spectrum. He's a former NBA basketball player as well. And um, it's it's a book about the shadow we cast as leaders and uh, focuses on, um, I suppose, how we can be more inclusive leaders. Mm, very good, I like that one. Great, so we're now on to the, uh, the two minute top tip, leadership top tip. So Melanie, would you once again introduce yourself and then share with them your two minute top tip and why that's so relevant to you? And then we'll finish at that stage. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, I'm Melanie Richards, and I'm the former deputy chair of KPMG in the UK and now sit on the board of Morgan Stanley International as a non-executive. Um, I'm also on the boards of the Eve Appeal, which is a charity that uh, raises an awareness and um, funds research into the early detection and prediction of gynecological cancers. Gosh, that was a mouthful. Uh, the National Theatre and the Invictus Games. Uh, and my top tip, well, it's to calibrate, don't catastrophize. You know, those moments where you extrapolate out to the worst ever scenario, um, bring yourself back and consider what the real rational reasons for what's happened has happened and what you can do about it. Yeah, that's, that's a great tip. Well, look, Melanie, thank you very much for, for being on the Inspire Leadership Series. Uh, great wisdom and experience. And I'm sure people will still continue very much to value your advisory capacity and, and helping them as they struggle with the challenges in our third year of, of the pandemic or the endemic, I think we should call it. Uh, but thank you very much for being on the series. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun.